Hi, so today we're going to be going over the topic of symbolic execution, but first we want to go over how we're going to present on this material. First off, we want to tell you that our demo isn't going to be something like a showing off a specific tool, though we will come to that at the end. Really, what we want to demo is our ideal version of a symbolic execution engine. And what this will do is rather than getting into the nitty gritty and confusing parts of symbolic execution, we want to go over what is the, you know, the, the fun parts and the interesting parts and give you sort of the big concepts that symbolic execution does. So we're just going to call our engine NEAT. It stands for the non-existent executable traverser. And it's going to show you how sort of you go about thinking when you're doing symbolic execution. But we're also going to go over the concretes of the concepts. And we hope to discuss some important papers while we do so to give you an idea of the sort of the cutting edge of the field. So here's the overview of the buggy code we're going to be going over throughout the process. This will be the code that we use in the demo. And you can see that it's pretty short, but we think that it can show off the big ideas of symbolic execution effectively. Just know that most of the time in a real symbolic execution engine, the code is going to be much bigger and much more complicated. But NEAT can only really handle small code and isn't real in the first place. So we're just going to show off the big ideas through this. What is symbolic execution? Symbolic execution is a means of software analysis primarily geared toward testing, where given a program um, and its many components, how can we understand the properties of those components um, so that we can uh, find bugs? And whenever we find those bugs, what inputs cause them? Um, so for example, here we have a very complex program that if we were just to randomly feed inputs, um, it, might not, it might not ever reach um, the deeper components, such as these black ones, which, which have um, bugs in them. Um, so this paper, which we'll get to later, for example, um, this is one of the data set programs, and it required modifying um, the state of all of these components with this very long input string, which we normally wouldn't have been able to find uh, without symbolic execution. So let's begin with a simple example of symbolic execution. Here we have a seven-line program that reads two integers x and y and raises an error if certain um, conditions hold regarding those two variables. Um, there are kind of two parts to the symbolic execution of a program. There's the actual execution of it, and then the symbolic constraints that are put on those inputs, um, and then the solving of those constraints. So you can begin at the top, where x and y are represented symbolically as a and b. Um, stepping down into the second uh, operation, we have a branch condition, which for the time being we will assume is being true because we're interested in you know exploring all the all the states of the program. Um, we're we're now updating the value of x to be b. Now four again still traversing with the assumption that a is greater than b. Um, we know passing it to the solver that this um, is unsatisfiable, so we can ignore this segment and then. We're finally met with 6, where we pass it, um, pass this constraint to the solver again, and it tells us that it's unsatisfiable. So we know that somewhere in this program we made an improper assumption. Um, so we will begin by returning to this assumption, um, now holding it as false, repeating similarly, um, setting x equal to a plus 1 instead, according to the new um, flow of the program. And passing it to the constraint, we see that this is satisfiable with the conditions that a is equal to 2, b is equal to 4. So let's take a deeper look at what the uh, solver is doing. Um, SAT solving is an MP complete problem in computer science. Um, it takes an input Boolean formula and then decides if there are um, variable assignments within that formula um, such that the formula is correct. And then if so, what are those assignments? Um, but we're interested in the assignment of integers, um, not, not booleans. So how, how do we solve for this? Um, there's, there's an extension to the problem of SAT called SMT, or Satisfiability Modulo Theory, which lets these variables be formulas or theories. Um, in the context of our programs, um, these theories 
are bit vectors, um, which can be used to represent integers. So for example, in programming we know that integers aren't strictly the integers of mathematics, but are instead sequences of bits um, or booleans. Um, so using these theories, for example, bit, again, bit, 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 yeah, bit vectors for the integers, um, we represent them as these sequence of bits, same with the constants, um, reduce this to the appropriate uh, or corresponding Boolean formula, and then pass this to the SAT solver to, quote, bit bash or find the um, corresponding A, A and B values um, that make this true. So if you were creating a symbolic executor in 2007, you may have used the SMT solver known as STP. Um, at the time, it was really popular for its novel treatment of arrays and bit vectors. Um, normally, whenever you reason about arrays and bit vectors, or say you have a, a constraint that involves the two of them, you solve the constraints on your, your two uh, separate types individually, and then you kind of merge um, the 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 inferences that you've made upon, uh, upon the two of them later. But this was able to do something different um, and, and faster in that you, you transform the theories into um, some sort of conjunctive normal form uh, Boolean expression that represents the variable. And then with that, you know, you can, you can merge um, and combine anything that way. There's, there's no um, sort of precondition, preconditions that have to be, be met um, like in Nelson Oppen. Modern symbolic executors uh, tend to use Z3, a theorem prover by Microsoft Research. Um, some of the things it does well is its support for strings, arbitrary sized arrays, and nonlinear arithmetic. It also has a couple of optimizations. Um, one of the interesting ones is its propagation of relevancy. So in SAT solving, there's kind of two ways to do it. There's a Tableau Calculus or DPLL. Um, the latter of which is not only faster than the first, but it's also the only one that can be used in SMT solving, um, thanks to the extension DPLLT. Um, but Tableau Calculus does have a couple of neat things. For example, it's able to uh, like look at a constraint tree and say that certain branches are relevant to the solving of, of the satisfi uh, satisfiability problem. Um, where DPL doesn't have that, but the Z3 authors were able to mimic that um, in an algorithm that they used to extend DPLT. Researchers have also developed extensions and plugins for Z3. Um, in 2013, a team created Z3 String, which adds um, improved theories uh, that can be used to reason about strings and operations on them, and using it, they found a number of remote uh, execution exploits. Still work to be done, though, in SMT solving, particularly in nonlinear arithmetic. Um, a couple of researchers in 2012 developed a library called SMT Rat, where they were interested in um, solving constraints on nonlinear arithmetic. And you can see they competed against C3 in a number of data sets, two of which they performed better in. Um, and kind of one of the key takeaways from this was that a lot of theorem provers today um, compartmentalize the arithmetic solver away from the SAT solver, where if you have the two reason and work together, um, you can actually make a more efficient solver. So now we get on to our next section, path evaluation. This involves looking at the overall control flow of the program. So things like if statements, for loops, and function calls. This is where a symbolic execution engine will attempt to pick a path or pick an area of the code to evaluate. As you saw with our previous section on SMT solving, we can break down a code to its bare roots. However, this is not possible to do over the entire program, and often will take an incredibly long time for a computer to figure out. So really, we have to choose the areas of code we really want to evaluate. And this is usually a balance between breadth, or searching the large code base, and depth, you know, targeting a function. With breadth, you have, you have to control this because if you evaluate too many paths at once, your computer explodes. You run out of resources. However, if you go too deep into a path, you might spend a lot of time evaluating something that's not important. So path evaluation is a huge balancing act between picking good paths and evaluating them, but also trying to get breadth in there. So let's look at how Neat handles this. We have this main function with a few branches, and we can see how there's some typical things going on and there's some functions we don't know. So we need to pick a path to evaluate. So Neat's going to look at these if statements and try and decide 
which area makes the most sense or which area is the most interesting. So here, Neat chooses the second or the first, or sorry, the second if statement and then an if else statement after that. You can see how it contains two variables that might be of interest and it contains two function calls that take those variables. You can see how the other ones, it doesn't prioritize. And this is common. Symbolic execution engines have to choose which ones to evaluate and they generally prioritize what's important. So neat here chooses ones that looks like it might do something good. And you can also see how some functions might not be very interesting, such as a call to printf with a single static string as input. But this can change from engine to engine, and it's all up to the designers to choose how this works. But with neat, we choose these two branches. So for a look more deeply into the research, uh, there's a lot of different ways path evaluation happens. One of my favorite stat sim uses dynamic analysis to effectively generate test sets for something akin to a machine learning algorithm that tries to decide which paths are the best one to take. And it does it through a really simple statistical function, but it's cool because it lays out a framework that you could apply a much more advanced statistical prediction method and get a really cool way of evaluating the code and picking good branches. Also, another paper talking about a chop symbolic execution uses user input. So the user will specify uninteresting places of the code that aren't very valuable to evaluate. You can see how people get really creative with how to knock off certain blocks and ignore bad areas that aren't interesting. And finally, we have something really important, which is external call abstraction. We'll talk about this more later, but you can think of this as symbolically representing library calls or having code that automatically handles something like C functions, stuff that's built in like ATOY or printf. These are consistent among programs, so it's often better to already have an idea of how these work so that you don't waste time reevaluating them. There are a number of approaches to software testing, each of them having their own benefits. And so the idea of a hybrid technique such as Driller is to combine the benefits of multiple techniques into something that's even better. Um, so we have here Driller, which combined a white box fuzzer with a selective concolic executor um, to find deep vulnerabilities in 126 binaries provided by DARPA in one of their competitions. The idea is that programs tend to structure themselves into clusters of relatively uh, simplistic logic that a, that a fuzzer can quickly break through, but that a symbolic executor might have difficulty with due to path explosion. But the symbolic executor is still useful for these uh, complex linkages between the clusters. Um, and so by passing off work between the two of them, they can reach these deep states quicker um, and more effectively and, and find the vulnerabilities that lie there. So it was interesting on the uh, 126 binaries, um, the fuzzer itself was able to discover 68 of them, the symbolic executor uh, only 16, and then together they were able to discover 77 vulnerabilities and win third place um, in the competition and get $750,000. So it was kind of interesting that the fuzzer was able to do that much by its own, but yet the symbolic executor was still important for that, that last 12%. So a second hybrid technique is that of mayhem, which kind of identifies two current approaches to symbolic execution, offline execution and online execution. Um, and then it imagines what it would be like if you combined the benefits of, of the two approaches, and then it does exactly that with its, with its hybrid method. Um, so offline executors have the benefit that they can run pretty much indefinitely and reach really deep portions of the program to find exploits. But they have the downside that in those kind of depth first search approaches, they often have to go back to the beginning and repeat a lot of the work that they do. Um, and then online executors have the benefit that because they fork at each conditional branch, they're, they're never going back to the beginning to repeat work. But because they have all those forkings, um, in memory, they often can't get very deep into the program to find those exploits because they eventually run out of memory and then they just stop and just stop executing. So in their hybrid approach, they, they develop kind of a, a memory manager for the symbolic executor so that whenever um, it, it executes in an online form and it caches kind of all of the operations and uh, path conditions that it takes, but then whenever it meets the 
uh, memory watermark. It saves the work of its executors at checkpoints uh, as checkpoints, then selects from a rank list of checkpoints to resume from, um, and then restores the cache patch formula of the checkpoints, um, and then and then resumes. So our next section is on symbolic variables, and this is a really important thing to deal with with symbolic execution because this comes down to how we'll represent our variables in our engine so that they're easy to evaluate. And by that we mean since many engines are only dealing with a few concrete values or often not even making any concrete assumptions at all, we need to have a way of representing things that in a way that a computer can understand. And also we need to choose which variables we want to want to represent. Generally speaking, these are represented as bit vectors. So let's say we have an int We'll represent that as a bit vector so that we can do logical inference based on the changes in the bits. And this has a lot to do with uh, an int being ordered inherently and having defined states. And on top of this, we need to understand how the operations apply to those variables. So here we're going to look at how neat handles this. So we have a few variable declarations at the beginning of the program. And we can see how there's a bunch of different things happening. And we need to pick which variables we want to represent symbolically. Now, it can change. Again, each different engine might have a different way of identifying these. Often the user will pick the main symbolic variable, and the engine will then generate symbolic variables based off of that variable's interaction with others. So first, what are, what's, but we often need to ask the question about what's changing or what's causing the program output to vary. So here we choose to declare int x and int y as symbolic. And this is important because we're looking at things that have direct input into the function. See, things like argc or argv, that should be chosen too sometimes. But in this case, we, our engine or even the user might only choose to look at these two variables because we know something about the program. However, if you look at how they're getting assigned, it's using a toy, which is actually a pretty tough function. I mean, you can see here how it blows up pretty quickly in terms of how much you have to evaluate to understand a toy. So this is where abstracting library calls often comes in. Uh, Neat, just like many other symbolic execution engines, will have an internal understanding of how these calls work or reference these in some way. Now, we do it here in a super abstract way that's not really real, but it gives you the idea of how a symbolic execution is going to take a C function and map it to something different internally. We, we want to turn X and Y into bit vectors, and we want the engine to play with them as if they're symbolic values. And we need that to be easy, and ATOY makes that really complicated. So here we just give it, give it a behavior that we can understand. So to go a little bit more into the research in the field, generally symbolic variables are pretty easy to figure out in terms of integers and such. But as we get to bigger and bigger programs, we need to reduce the amount of symbolic variables we have. One paper looked at taking things like functions and trying to map them to single symbolic values. And the logic here gets incredibly complicated. But the idea is that they can extend, thing like, extend things like Z3 to treat functions themselves as symbolic variables with these sort of bit vectors as parameters. So you can think of a function having two parameters, and those parameters changing could be mapped into a function. And the program might be able to understand that function just based on the two changing parameters. Again, this gets really complicated. Uh, we also have things like pointer reasoning that is important because pointers are treated differently than other parts of code. Often, pointers don't really reference something that's consistent. You can think of the stack as a linear linear array of operations. A variable gets changed in the stack in a linear order. However, a pointer changes arbitrarily. So anytime we're dealing with pointers, we have to look at the state independent of the path. And this is what our diagram shows. It shows kind of how a symbolic execution engine might try to see a variable changing independent of, of the actual program. And finally, floating point representations. As we talked about before, the data type in which you represent the symbolic variable is very important. And things like ordering and easily 
satisfiable constraints don't really exist with floating point numbers. They can have lots of different values that sometimes conflict with each other. So another paper we read tried to view how different teams went about dealing with these depending on the program they were using. And it generally involved mapping floats into things like ordered floats and trying to represent floating point numbers in a way that could be possibly expressed with a bit vector. Here we have an example using anger. Um, this binary is taken from the second exam. Um, sadly, as the subtitle of this presentation states, we wish we knew this earlier, but alas. Um, so yeah, using anger, we can feed the binary, specify the conditions under which a uh, successful output state has been reached, um, or otherwise, and then it will explore all the branches of the executable and uh, solve for the proper input required in order to um, to reach that state. So, for example, here we specified and is successful, saying you did it, um, and then abort is, is try again, and it was able to discover that the uh, input variable was A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So, now we come to our conclusion. And we've talked about how things like SMT solvers and tools like Z3 help us eliminate and break down code inside of functions. We've also talked about things like path evaluation and hybrid techniques and fuzzing that are about helping us lower the amount of time it takes to solve a problem and about making the symbolic process more efficient. And we've also talked about how data types and symbolic variables are critical to get right because their representations help us evaluate code more effectively. But we're going to talk about how these apply to concrete challenges and sort of the forefront of research in the field right now. Now you can see below all the different things that symbolic execution is trying to work with. This comes from a paper that talks about benchmarking different engines. And within that paper, even the most... Uh, forefront high performance engines out there like Anger, Klee, Manticore, they all struggled pretty immensely with even short programs. Uh, these were all based on benchmarks, and many of those benchmarks were barely 50 lines long, and things like Anger couldn't even deal with them. So you can see how this field has a very long way to go, but it's getting very good at what it does. So the research that we saw tended to focus on things like improving pathfinding heuristics, uh, making a program easier to traverse for, an, for uh, an engine, because ultimately it comes down to how long it takes to look through a program. And that is what decides if a symbolic execution engine is feasible. Uh, and also managing things like resources are incredibly important. Most symbolic execution engines even require a larger stack to, to function correctly. We also have looking at things like symbolic SMT solvers and adv advancing their reasoning, maybe representing functions more symbolically, having larger areas that can be evaluated using an SMT solver. We also have things like fuzzing and online versus offline symbolic execution. This is sort of the difference between pure symbolic execution and concolic execution that we've talked about. And this has to do with trying to find the best way to go about things. And often this looks at taking what's in the field and taking the different tools like Klee, Anger, Manticore, whatever, and combining those together and finding what the best, best, best parts of each of those are. And finally, we have the struggle to represent data types correctly. Things like floating point values, things like pointers. These are things that don't have an easy way to look at. They create a lot of problems because with pointers, they're not evaluated in a linear fashion and they exist independent of the logic. And with floating point values, they don't make a lot of sense because they don't have an easily evaluatable logic, logical structure. They're not inherently ordered and their bits don't really have any real reasoning outside of the encoding. On top of this, things like arrays and data structures or any uh, heterogeneous structure is really difficult for symbolic engineering to handle or symbolic execution to handle. So these are big areas of research in the field right now.